Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. The first round's over and duck hunting season starts in Alberta. As always, it's Dan and Matt here with you, and this is the first time ever in Fireside Chat history we're talking about second round of playoff hockey. How you doing, Matt? Eh, okay. You know, no big deal. Just okay? Yeah, it, it was fine. You know, the dome was quiet and not very into the game in game six. Uh. You and I must have been in a very different <laughs> dome, my friend. Yeah, no, that's was awesome. My ears are still ringing several days later. You and I both managed to be at the game, not together, but we're both at game six. And we'll get there, but why don't we start by recapping the series since the last time we talked to everybody. Uh, we talked just after game three. We were previewing game four at the time. So why don't we start there? Game four was the second game at home in the two and two for the Flames. And they got a big win over Vancouver with the three to one win. Uh, you were at that game. What were your thoughts? I liked that, that the Flames not only got out early, but when the Canucks responded uh, like four or five minutes later, that the Flames scored almost uh, like right after that, and then they got a third one, and then after the first intermission, they just shut the door and did not allow the Canucks to do anything. Yeah, it was a weird game from the Flames standpoint that way. I mean, if you look at it, three and a half minutes into the game, Johnny Goudreau scores, nine minutes into the game, Yari Hoodler, and then 19 minutes, Sam Bennett, and then no scoring in periods two and three, which usually were the ones that come out hard in two and three. Well, you knew that Vancouver was going to throw everything at the Flames in the third period because the last thing that they wanted to do was to go back to Vancouver down 3-1 in the series. And they did get 15 shots in the period, but Calgary did a very effective job at limiting their ability to get any significant scoring chances. Yeah. And when they did, Jonas Hiller was there to make an awesome save and keep it in Flames' hands. You know, Jonas Hiller is really starting to look like Mika Kiprasov this playoff, isn't he? Like, he's coming up big in times we don't expect him to be big. He's saving stuff he shouldn't be saving. He he reminds me a lot of Kipper. Yeah, definitely the best goaltending performances since Kipper. And, yeah, the, in Game 4, like it, especially in the, that third period, some of the saves that he was making, he had no business doing so, but he just managed to get his toes on it or his glove or whatever and keep it out. Yeah, he, he looked almost superhuman at certain times. Which that had to be very frustrating for the Canucks because, you know, you're throwing everything at the guy and you can't beat him. Like, not even a fluky bounce or anything. Well, you could tell by the end of the game they were getting frustrated too. Oh, yeah. And that's that whole BX uh, punching out Furland and Hamus and Burroughs. And it was right before this game, speaking of Bieksa, that, uh, was it Burroughs got taken out? I can't recall off the top okay. of my head. Yeah, there. I th it was Burroughs though, right? That was the player yeah. that got removed? Yeah, I think it was right before this game, and uh, he got removed from the Saddle Dome on a stretcher, and it sounds like it's probably a punctured lug of some kind because he's not cleared to fly. Yeah. So, you know, don't want to say that a guy getting hurt was good for the Flames, but I think that not having Burroughs on the ice and, of course, Sven Berchi, um, not this game, but the next one, game five slots in, um, was probably good for the Flames. Yeah, like, you don't like to see anybody get hurt, even a guy like Burroughs, but that's the nature of playoffs, and it's how your replacement players play, and we've seen... Like a guy like David Schlemko take huge minutes and Derek England after Giordano went down. And a guy like Sven Berchi came in and was invisible. Well, and that's why the Flames are where they are. You know, I mean, we're getting the replacement players. We're getting the Flames, um, you know, depth guys who are stepping up. And that's been the, the case all season. Well, you look at a guy like Michael Furland and his four points in the six games, he only had five points in the, the 26 regular season games that he played. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a good game all around. I think, you know, as Flames fans, it was electric. I wasn't there, but you could hear it on TV. 
And were you surprised the Flames were able to win game four and essentially win both their first two home games? Actually, uh, yeah, I was expecting the Canucks to have a larger pushback because, you know, who wants to return home down 3-1? Yeah. So I was quite impressed with the fact that the Flames were able to just keep them at bay and push forward and get the victory. I don't know about you, but it seemed to me at the end of Game 4 like the Canucks maybe gave up a little bit. Um, we, you know, we started to see the chippy play again. We started to see the Canucks not really playing the game anymore, and it just seemed like you know they'd, they'd maybe given up a little bit. Yeah, they were starting to play a little dirty, like when Yannick Weber hit Hiller, and then, of course, Hamuse and uh, Bieksa and Burroughs went off on a little bit of a dirty streak. But... You know, that's the nature of things, and, you know, the Flames pressed through and actually were able to win the series, so it didn't have the effect that the Canucks were hoping for like it did for Calgary in Game 2. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, After that, the Flames were up 3-1 in the series, and we took it back to Vancouver for Game 5, and the Flames ended up losing um, 2-1. I'm not surprised. I didn't expect the Flames to... To win this game, I think that the Canucks knew what was riding on this game and had to win it. And if you take a look, they really outshot us. Uh, the Canucks had 43 shots in Game 5 versus our 21. And I just felt like right from the beginning of the game, the Canucks came out hard. And I think that they, to their credit, it was the best game I've seen them play all playoffs, maybe even all year. And they knew what had to be done, and they got it done, and they kept the pressure on so we couldn't come back. Yeah, it was very much like the third period of Game 4, but throughout the entire contest of Game 5. And you knew that was going to happen, and unfortunately the Flames did fall in that game. But on the positive side, they only lost 2-1, and that's with Vancouver throwing everything in the kitchen sink at them. That's true. And that's, again, a game where I think without Hiller playing the way that Hiller played, the score would have gone way up. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, Hiller really saved our bacon there. Yeah, and one good bounce at the other end, and that game goes to overtime. Exactly. So I don't have a lot to say about Game 5. It's what I expected from the Canucks. Um, I guess the Flames maybe didn't have the push I expected, but, you know, in the end it's... It was we we both thought it'd be six and it ended up taking six. So anything else about game five you want to talk about? No, that game pretty much was what I was expecting. I I didn't expect Vancouver to go quietly into the night. They have uh, too much pride for that after being a solid playoff team for many years. You know they they don't break easily. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at the way they're built, they're built to be a playoff team where we are really not. You know, I think they have better depth all through their lineup. I think they've got more grit than we do, if you look at them on paper. And I knew that if they wanted to, they'd be able to mount that kind of a comeback. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with you on the depth or the physicality, but it's they're a decent team, and... You know, you have to beat the better teams in order to become the better team. and That's the name of the game this time of year. Yeah, and like that's why like when the Flames play the Ducks, it's a good challenge for them because of the fact that they're the best team in the West. Well, before we get to the Ducks then, let's talk about the last game of the Vancouver series. Uh, the Flames brought the series back home on Saturday night to a jam-packed Saddledome. Both you and I were there. And Matt, as my first... The first playoff game I've ever been to uh, in my life, I couldn't believe how loud it was in that building. Oh, yeah. It gets quite raucous in the Sile Dome in the playoffs. Even Bob Hartley said after the game, he said by the end of that game, they had to yell the line changes to their players because they couldn't hear each other on the bench, which is pretty pretty funny. Well, Romo in net, uh, he said he couldn't hear the puck hit the glass off a slap shot. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Yeah, and he's right by the glass, so, you know, that tells you a little something there. And, you know, I think as I look back on it, we couldn't have had a better game told or a better story told, I should say, in one game than what we got in Game 5. Um, we got into that game, and in the first period, Calgary was down 3 nothing. 
I mean, you know, by ha- halfway through the first, we we had McMillan, uh, Yannick Hansen, and Rodham Verbata all get a goal. Yeah, it reminds me of Game 6 against the Canucks in 2004 when they got out to a 4 nothing lead and the Flames fought all the way back in that one, pushing it to triple overtime before falling to the Canucks it off a Brendan Morrison goal. That's a good point. Yeah, and then um, I was so happy near the end when Michael Furland scored his first goal of the playoffs and got us a 3-1 score on the board. I just thought that the Flames really needed that uh, going into the second to at least have something up on the board. Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well, that if the Flames could get a goal before the intermission, that they'll win the game. It's just they needed to not allow Miller to get in their heads. And I think it also helped the fans. I mean, I was worried after three goals that the the Sea of Red was just going to die off. They're going to dry up, and the Flames wouldn't have their support anymore. Because, I mean, 3 nothing in the first, that is often a winning score. And I think that if we went into the break without having the Flames get a goal, we they might have lost the crowd. Possibly, but the Flames fans are a little crazy, so you knew that they were going to try their best to get behind them in the beginning of the second. And then early in the second, um, we start out the second pretty much right away in the second. Sean Monahan gets a goal, brings us up 3-2, and I was sitting there thinking, now we got ourselves a hockey game. And just a few minutes later, Johnny Gaudreau puts one past Miller, and we got a 3-3 tie. And I was sitting there, I remember, thinking, wow, how do we go from being down three to being all tied up? Yeah, and that's... You skipped over a very important part there, and that was the shift by Derek England. Three minutes and 30-some-odd seconds straight after the Flames iced the puck four times. He was stuck out there the entire time. (laughs) Yes. And then on the very next shift, the Flames tied it. So That's right. Yeah, and, you know, England, I think, in that game, played the best game I've seen him play with a flaming C in his chest. He didn't look like Derek England. He, I don't know what what had got into him, but, yeah, he was uh, he was playing like a, a great uh, defenseman. Yeah, uh, 10 block shots, which may or may not be a playoff record. If it's not, it's close. And Three minutes, 22 seconds was the length of that shift. Yeah, and like, that's just ridiculous for one player... Like, I'm sure that uh, when Rommel made the save and covered the puck that England wanted to go hug him (laughs) just to get off the ice. And if you look at uh, England's average for that game, his average shift length is 48 seconds. Yeah, and he actually played the third highest amount of minutes in that game that he had in his entire career. Wow. Total time on ice for him was 24 minutes, 29 seconds, so... He played over a whole period, which is first line. I mean, that's the kind of minutes we would expect Giordano to play. Exactly. And he was on the first pairing, so that makes sense. Yeah, and it's remarkable how much he's stepped up and improved his game overall. Like, I know a lot of fans, like, halfway through the season were like, why did we pay him $3 million? And Well, we've even had that discussion here. Yeah, and he's more than earned it (laughs) well i think that's true of everybody on this roster i don't think you can look at the flames roster right now and pinpoint somebody who hasn't stepped up and you know played the best hockey of their career can't argue with you there and then um after we tied it up and i actually said to my friend who i was at the game with i said if you look at all the hard work the flames just went through we're right back where we started i mean if you think about it we start the game tied After all this work, the Flames ended the game tied. Or not ended, but were in a tie position halfway through the second. And it's like, wow, all that hard work and we're back where we started. And then what happens? Vancouver goes out and gets another goal and pulls ahead yet again. And I was thinking, wow, you know, this just every time that we get something going on, they they keep taking it away from us. And now they're up again. Yeah, I wasn't actually at all concerned when Sabiza scored that goal. Uh you just knew that the Flames were not going to go back to Vancouver. And they just stepped it up from that point on and didn't take their foot off the accelerator. Yeah, for sure. And and then they came out. There was no other score in that period. But when the Flames came out in the third, and I really saw it 
right away in the third, you could tell that they, I don't know what was said in the dressing room, but you could tell that they were not leaving this building without the W. Yeah, they smelt the blood in the water and they were <laughs> out for it, that's for sure. And then the Flames tied the game at 6-14 into the third. Yari Hoodler got a point, and it was good to see that first line this whole game clicking. I mean, we saw... Um, you know, we saw the Sean Monahan goal assisted by Hoodler in the second. We saw the Hoodler goal in the third. We finally were seeing that first line really clicking, which was great. Yeah, they ended up uh, with 10 points between the three of them. Uh, Gaudreau and Monahan had three points each, with Hoodler having a career high four point night. Yeah. And then at 1543 in the third, the place went electric when Matt Stajan got his first goal of the playoffs, assisted by Mike Furland and Dave Jones. And that was the game-winning goal. That gave the Flames a 5-4 lead. And I don't know about you, you could tell that not only did the building get electric, the Flames started playing harder, and you could tell that the the Vancouver Canucks had the wind taken out of their sails. Yeah, actually, um, watching at home, uh, I was uh, notified that uh, right, like the shift prior to the stage and goal, uh, the CBC, they had uh, panned the both benches. And you could see that, like, the Canucks just looked defeated. And this yeah. was still while it was 4-4. And then it panned over to the Flames bench and, like, everybody was into it. So just the energies on the bench, you could tell that, like, the Flames were going to go for it. And it was just a matter of time. And then they ended up going out and getting a empty net goal at 1931. Yari Hoodler got his third of the playoffs, assisted by Monaghan and Goudreau, to make it 6-4. And I don't know about you, I was shocked when Vancouver didn't put the goalie back in. Well, your season's on the line. You know, you got to throw that Hail Mary after that. And the Flames ended up capitalizing on it as Furland got his second playoff goal um, to make the game 7-4. to four. And if you think that at the end of the first, we were down 3-1, to one, what a comeback by the Flames. Well, after being down 3-0, the Flames outscored Vancouver 7-1. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, you're right. Just insane, uh, this team. And, like, you can't put them away. Like, you get a three-goal lead, that should be the ball game. And instead, oh, well, we got you right where we want you. And... Well, exactly, and and that's and I heard people joking in the in the stands when the Flames were down by three goals, saying we got them just where we want them, and it's like, ah, okay, ha ha ha, you know, we're all trying to make each other feel better, but yeah, it's like, wow, we came back, like you said, seven to one, is coming into the third. It was it was a crazy night for Flames fans. Oh yeah, it was fun. Looking forward to more playoff action next round. That's for sure. And I think in a way, too, you can look at this and it's almost it's almost like a warning to the Ducks. You know, Vancouver had these guys down by three goals and they came back. Yeah, well, Van Anaheim isn't uh, unfamiliar with third period comebacks. The Flames and Ducks were actually tied for the most comebacks in the third period. Wow. In the regular season. So I think both teams will want to enter the third period tied. Probably. So, Matt, it was a hell of a game. Uh, game six, we both predicted it would be six games, and we're right. Um, looking back at the series, any final thoughts on this series? Uh, just glad that they managed to eliminate Vancouver. You know, I, I Vancouver is my least favorite team in the NHL, so it's always nice to see them fail. <laughs> so, And it's just doubly nice that the Flames were the ones that managed to put them away. For sure. Um, and it was it was a great series for Flames fans and for the players. I mean, you could tell uh, they were so happy at the end. When we look back at the series, who would you say if you had to if you had to give that Flames fire helmet that they give to the MVP of the game to someone for the whole round, who would you say was the Flames MVP this round? I'm going to go with somebody that didn't necessarily score a lot of goals or get a lot of points. And I'm going to go with TJ Brody. And why Brody? Because he really stepped up his game and ended up becoming a legitimate number one defenseman in this playoffs. And not only that, I think he will be looked upon in the future to possibly represent Canada at future international tournaments. 
He did everything that the Flames needed him to. And I don't think the Flames, if he didn't elevate his game, I don't think the Flames move on. It's a good point. He, I think to me, he got out from under Giordano's shadow. He's not Robin to the Batman anymore. He's now, like you said, showing he can be on his own with Derek England as his partner. He can be a legitimate number one defenseman. And that's not to say that there's just one MVP. Like, there are, like, I could have listed about 10 different names and yeah. made a legitimate case for each of them. I think you could make a legitimate case for pretty much everybody who put a flaming C on their chest in that round. Exactly. I can't think of one guy who I look at and say he did nothing. Mason Raymond. <laughs> that's true. Okay, so one guy. If I'm going with the MVP, I'm still, I think, for me, going to go with the guy I thought would probably play that role at the beginning of the first round. I'd say Michael Furland. I think, to me, Furland played a bigger role in this series than I thought he would. I think Furland became a bigger part of this team than we thought he would. I mean, if you if you look at the call-ups this year, the guys that are currently on the team, you know, we got Josh Juris, who's a bit of an unknown. You know, we've got Marcus Granlin, who we know about. But uh, Drew Shore was heavily touted. But to me, Furland kind of came out of nowhere and has become the star of this round. And, you know, I think credit's due for the kid because he's really established himself as a an important part of the Flames' offense. Yeah, I, uh, that would have been my number two pick there. And, yeah, I can't argue at all. He got in the heads of Vancouver, got under their skin, and ended up putting the first and last goal against them in Game 6. Matt, were you able this time, I know you said you didn't after Game 3, were you able after f Game 4 or Game 6 to go down on the Red Mile? No, unfortunately. I had to do it. I thought, you know what, I'm going to the game. Um, I'm, I am I got my tickets through Ticketmaster. A friend of mine won the ticket draw, and I paid about 350 bucks for the ticket, and I actually priced it out. I paid six minutes per or six dollars per minute of hockey. And at the beginning of the game, I thought I'm not getting my money's worth. But in the end, boy, did I get my money's worth. And I thought, well, I'm there. I want to go down the red mile. I was really too young to enjoy the red mile last time in 04. And I have to say, it was it was crazy. It was so many people after game six just walking around, high-fiving each other. And there was this instant camaraderie among everybody just because they're wearing a red shirt. Yeah, the Red Mile was nuts in 04. Uh, yeah, I was 19 at the time, so... Uh, but, yeah, uh, it's good to see that the fans are being responsible and enjoying themselves in a more professional manner than 04. Yeah, I was 17 at the time. Um, so, you know, I was down there a little bit, but didn't really get to partake in a lot. And, you know, I think the big difference between the two is in 04, it was an organic thing. It just kind of happened. And, you know, people just left the dome and wanted to party, and 17th is right there, and it happened. And this time, it was it was contrived. I mean, people knew, okay, after the game, this is where we go, and this is the way it's going to work. And I think when I look at it, I mean, the cops are out there, which I think really had a, uh impact on how professional it was because the police were walking around all over. But it was, it was quite a cool atmosphere to just be down there and hanging out with Flames fans and you know, not even that there was disrespect or anything. I didn't see any, but just hanging out in the middle of the street, talking about the Ducks, you know, giving some some friendly ribbing to the Canucks fans that are down there. I think if you walk the red mile in a blue jersey, you're expecting some ribbing. And it was it was a lot of fun. If anyone, even if you're not at the games, if you get the chance next round to go the red mile, definitely go because I think it brings your Flames experience to another level. Matt, you got to go too. Yeah, I know. Do do the do the game report later, or you know, bring your laptop and do it, and then go to the mile or something like that. Oh yeah, no, I'll probably end up going for some of the road games. Yeah, I don't know how good it'd be during the road games, but you could definitely give it a shot. And you know, no matter where you are, and I said this before, but whether you're on the mile or off, this has got to be a good time for Calgary bar owners. There's a lot of money flowing in the city right now. Yeah, I'm sure that they're all hoping that the Flames go all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals. Just like everybody else in the city, right? Yep. Well, with the Canucks down, bring on the Ducks. Matt, it's it's time to go duck hunting. Well, in order to become one of the top teams in the league, you have to beat the top teams in the league. 
and Anaheim is one of the best in the NHL. As the great wrestler Ric Flair used to say, if you want to be the man, you got to beat the man. And, and yeah, and it, what's really when I look at it, what stands between the flames and sipping from Lord Stanley's mug is the Ducks. If I look at the teams that are still around, I think the hardest one to beat is going to be Anaheim if we're going to go all the way. Actually, for me, I think the Minnesota Wild are just a smidge more of a challenge than Anaheim. But See, I, I think if we get through Anaheim, though, I'm not too worried about Minnesota. Yeah. Well, I'm regardless, I'm cheering for Chicago in that series if the Flames can somehow find a way to beat Anaheim. Yeah, no, I, well, that's it. Uh, yeah, you're right. The Blackhawks would probably be an easier uh, an easier one for the Flames than Minnesota for sure. We finally have the schedule for uh, the second round. It came out today on Tuesday. Um, I'll let everybody know what the schedule is. It's a little bit weird. Uh, this The series will start on Thursday, April 30th. It's been confirmed. Um, obviously, we start in the Honda Center. That's an 8 p.m. start on Thursday, and it'll be on Sportsnet. Then there's a couple days break, and we don't play game two until Sunday. Uh, again, in the Honda Center, May 3rd at 8 p.m. The third game, they don't know when it's going to be played yet. It's uh, it's possibly Tuesday, May 3rd, or Wednesday, May 6th. It will be, if Tampa advances, the Flames will host the Ducks on Tuesday. If Detroit advances, the Flames will host game three on Wednesday. So we're not sure exactly which one, but either way, it'll be at 7.30 here. It's a 7.30 start. And the fourth game, then, there's a bit of a break, especially if they play Tuesday. There's a long break. Game four will be on Friday, May 8th here in Calgary. So those are the first four games, but the full schedule is on the Flames website. Odd schedule, don't you think, Matt? Yeah, I'm not really a fan of multiple day breaks. You know, if you have one, that's fine, but to have two, like, it just seems bizarre. Because, like, if the Flames play on Sunday... And then on Wednesday, there's two days there, or between Tuesday and Friday. It's just weird. And it's weird to me that Game 3 would change based on if Detroit or Tampa advances. Like, I don't understand how the two things are connected. Yeah, that, well, I think it has to do with their arena availability, but... But those are both he, those are both um, here in the Dome, so I don't know... Yeah, I don't understand. Uh, it... it it's weird, but you know it might have to do with the TV scheduling more than anything. And then games five, six, and seven, we're back to the one day in in between if needed. Game five will be Sunday, May tenth. Uh, game six will be Tuesday, May twelfth, and game seven will be Thursday, May fourteenth. So, yeah, it's it's kind of odd, but at the same time, I think it might work in the Flames' advantage. I think um, you know having more days between it is going to let us heal up a little bit between each game. Yeah, and th- that's the good thing, especially with so many injuries on our team, that the more rest, the better. For sure. The worry a lot of people have going into this round is the Honda Center curse, if you will. Uh, the The last regular season game that the Flames won in the Honda Center was January 19th, 2014, and the last playoff game they won was one of the the three that we played there in the 2006 playoff series. If you break that down, we've lost 20 straight regular season games at the Honda Center. And in that time, since the last time that we won a home game there, I believe that there's actually been two NHL lockouts since the last time we won in the Honda Center. That's kind of freaky to think about. It wasn't even called the Hana Center. It was the Arrowhead Pond at the time. So, like, they've even gone through a complete name change of the arena well. it's, as well. it's actually a different building, I believe. Yeah, I think well, that, either yeah. way, like, it, and it wasn't like the Flames had a lot of success before 2004. I think the last win for Calgary prior to 04 was in 99. Mm-hmm. So. Could be. You know, it. For whatever reason, the Flames are not very good in Anaheim, but I don't think that matters whatsoever. The playoffs are a different beast, and I don't think curses like that in the regular season matter. And like if you look at it, um, the Flames lo- only have lost one game uh, in the playoffs since their last victory. Interesting way to look at it. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And, no, I agree with you as well that I think the playoffs are a different victory or a different animal um, than, you know, the regular season. But I 
I can't help thinking that even, I mean, if it's in our minds, it might be in the players' minds too of, you know, that that curse kind of in the back of their mind. Well, one good thing is that we have Jonas Hiller, and I think he's won a few times in Anaheim. That's true. If anyone knows the Honda Center and where the where the bodies are buried, it's going to be Hiller. Um, what are your thoughts about Hiller starting? I mean, we saw in Game 6 the Flames change goalies. We didn't talk about that earlier. They changed goalies early on, and Ramo played most of that game. I thought Ramo looked really good in that game, um, but it's been announced that Hiller will be starting in Anaheim. I'm not surprised if for no other reason I think it gets in there in the Ducks' heads a bit. What are your thoughts? Should, which goalie should be starting that series? I agree with having Hiller. He really did step up in the series against Vancouver. Like If you look at the two goals that Vancouver scored on him, it, neither shot was... Like none of neither goal was his fault. It it was just excellent shots and that happens. And he was only pulled because the uh, Hartley wanted to shake the team up. So yeah. it you know it it just it was coincidental. It was two of the first three shots, but you know sometimes that happens. Would you say the Flames have finally found the number one goalie for today? Yes, that can change though. Like of if course. Hiller really struggles in game one, then you go with Kari Romo and you have a completely different number one. And I'm so glad that he's healthy. Yeah, exactly. Um, Going into round two, just so everybody knows, if we play Sam Bennett through the whole series, that will be his 10 games. So if, if Bennett continues to play, which I don't see why he wouldn't, he's looking good out there, uh, we will be burning a contract year on him, but... You know, the way I look at it is if Bennett can get us closer to a cup, I'm fine to burn that contract year. Yeah, like if the Flames end up going to the conference finals, I don't think that you'll have anyone either in the Flames organization or amongst the fans that will be lamenting that, oh, gee, we burned a contract year. Exactly. So, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to point that out to people that he is up the 10-game tryout still applies during the playoffs. And so he's played six games so far. So if he plays four in this series, or actually five in this series, I guess. No, him 11. Uh, it's actually only three because he played the one regular season oh, game. right, 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 right. Yeah. So he, played, he only needs to play three. I've kind of let that Winnipeg game go out of my mind because it really didn't matter at all. Yeah, preseason so, yeah. fun. <laughs> exactly, pretty much. So three games and uh, we burn the contract, but... I don't see them. I don't see Bennett coming out of the lineup for any reason. He's been one of the most solid players out there. Yeah, the only reason why he would be removed from the lineup is due to injury. So I don't see that being too much of a concern. No. I think if the Flames don't make it past the Ducks, I'm still satisfied with the season. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, and I think that... Uh, for this series, the thing that I would find to be most successful is if the Flames push it to six or seven if they do lose, because you don't want them to just roll over and get swept like the Jets good did. Good point. Yeah, good point. Yeah, but I think, you know, if if we lost to Vancouver, there was a pride thing there, their arrival. I think if we, if we lose the Ducks and we don't just roll over, I think... Everyone can look at this season and say, you know what, the Flames had great success. I think even just making it to the second round for the team that wasn't supposed to be here is a, is more than we could have asked for. Well, if you look in past teams that have come, been coming out of rebuilds, like Anaheim in 06 uh, against us and Chicago in 09 against us, each of those teams, it was their first playoff appearance, and they managed to beat us unfortunately both times and get more deeply into the playoffs and then the next season they won the stanley cup if the flames can have a good showing against the ducks even if they do lose then that will set them up for next year to make an even more extended run because they'll learn what it takes to beat those teams that's very true. Yeah, it's it's like we've talked about, you know, on the show before, even at the AHL, is we want these guys to have success and we don't want them to lose. You know, the more you can build success, the more you can say, hey, you know, even though we might have lost, we did our best, we did everything we could, you're teaching your players success. And especially for a young roster, that's so important right now. 
Yeah, and especially if you look at next year, the Flames have like, the lowest payroll, or very close to it, and you look at uh, free agents, they're going to be looking at Calgary and saying, hey, they're on the way up like Chicago was. You know. Yeah, well, we've instantly become much more attractive come July 1st, haven't we? Yeah, and like if I'm one of the top defensemen on the market, I'm like uh, saying to my agent, can I uh, sign there immediately? And, yeah, you give know, him a call, see what they'll offer me. Yeah, exactly. And it would be just what you would want in this situation as Flames fans that we will be one of, if not the top place to go. And, you know, even outside of free agents, which is going to be a big part of it, I wouldn't be surprised if there's somebody somewhere in the league, probably more than a couple guys, who may have a limited no movement and are going to amend that to have Calgary on that list now. Yeah, I can agree with that as well. And that could help us out too. If somebody calls the Flames and says, look, we got this big contract, no move, you're on the list, You know that, that could be very useful for us. When I look at the at the Ducks roster, Matt, there's a big concern I have, and that concern is everybody probably has when they look at it, is the, uh, the duo of Ryan Getzlaff and Corey Perry on their first line. The Flames were pretty much, for the most part, okay with, um, it, I wouldn't say immobilizing, but making the Sedins not as scary as they could have been. Which duo do you think the Flames are going to, should have a harder time with? Do you think it was the Sedins, or do you think it's going to be Getzlaff Perry? Well, actually, it's a good thing that the Flames had to deal with the Sedins, because Getzlaff and Perry are similarly talented caliber of players. It helps uh, to prepare for a very dangerous first line. Like, if you're playing a, another team, like say like Minnesota, where they have basically Zach Parise and then a bunch of lesser talented guys, like, you can kind of key in on the one guy. But mm -hmm. it with having two guys that are top-notch and having that experience in round one you can sort of prepare in the same way, give or take. Yeah, and, and I mean, there's more than just those two guys that are top-notch there, but yeah, there's there's a lot of good talent up front for the Ducks, and I agree, it's, it's not just those two being good talent, it's the way they play with each other that's so much like the Sedins. You never know which one of them is going to be the playmaker, which one of them is going to go in and score. Like, you've got to cover both of them equally. It's not a duo where we know, okay, this guy's going to make the pass and this one's going to score. And I think it's a lot harder to defend against that. Obviously it is. That's why the Ducks are doing so well. But, yeah, I agree. I think that the Sedins are good preparation for that. But to me, I look at Getzlaff and Perry as the, the more lethal of the two duos. They can do a lot more damage, I think. Yeah. And actually, in terms of overall roster depth, I don't think that Anaheim is that much better than Vancouver. Like, they are better, but it's marginal. Like, Jakob I, Silverberg... I, I would say that Vancou that uh, the Ducks are probably getting better performance from their guys. Like, I look at a guy like Cal pa Pal Palmieri, who, you know, I would never expect to do as well as he has been. And so I think they're a lot like the Flames. Even, you know, Michael Scarboza they're getting a lot better performance out of the guys. So they might not be better than Vancouver on paper, but I think they're getting better performance. Yeah, like if you look at their secondary players, like Jakob Silverberg is in the same ballpark as Redeem Verbata. And then you got Kessler, who's an upgrade on some of their players. But like if you go deeper in their roster, guys like Thomas Fleischmann, he's not very good. Tim Jackman that we're all familiar with. Bolesky's not been having a good postseason. So, you know, it there's not the same caliber of depth that you would expect from a top-tier team. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. But I think that the Ducks are probably able to ride that first line a lot more than Vancouver was able to ride their first line. Oh, yeah. And there's a reason why Anaheim was the best team in the conference. Yeah, exactly. I think um, the Ducks also probably have a better blue line than Vancouver. Oh, yeah. Uh, their blue line's been pretty much as good as ours has been. So, mm -hmm. like, I think uh, the Flames defenders scored 44 goals this season, and theirs scored 41. So, wow. pretty much 
they have to look out for Sammy Vatnin, who's very short, like Chris Russell, but uh, he can put the puck in the net. Yeah, he can. I mean, you know, again, even guys, James White is Newski can be a problem there. Um, Cam Fowler, like they've got a lot of good defensemen there. And I think that is going to, if our forwards can't get through those guys, it's game over. Yeah. And big defensemen too. Like I'm looking down the roster, you know, I'm seeing six, four, six, five, bunch of guys that are six, three. It's a big blue line. Yeah. But the thing is, is that Anaheim struggled this season when they were playing fast teams and that's true. Calgary is a fast team. So this is a favorable matchup for us because even though they are a very good team, they do struggle at times when playing a team that can get around their players. So do you think that one of the keys for success to Calgary is to not try and play the physical game, but to try and beat them with their speed? I think it's a combination. Like, you still need Furland and a couple of the other guys to continue throwing the hits, but that won't be the key to victory, like it was for Vancouver. You needed to get in the defenseman's head for Vancouver, and they managed to do that. But Anaheim, they're a lot shiftier, their defensemen. Uh, Their blue line's very similar to ours, and they can avoid hits a little easier than Vancouver's guys. And I don't think it's as necessary. Like, we saw Winnipeg throwing hit after hit after hit after hit, and uh, four games later, they're gone. So they need to exploit the one weakness that Anaheim seems to have on paper, and that is the speed. Yeah, I agree with you there. I think if we go out and try to play the physical game we played against Vancouver... We're going to end up just like Winnipeg did. Yeah. It's definitely going to be a part of the game, but it can't be the focus. No. You take the hits when you get them, but it, yeah, it's not vital. You play it's the not puck vital. over the body this series. Yeah, exactly. And just get that puck in their zone and go fight for it. Yeah. What else do you think is going to be a key to victory, Matt? If you had to lay out a game plan for the Flames, if you're in there with, with Coach Hartley, what what can we do to take down the Mighty Ducks? Uh, find a way to beat Frederick Anderson. Now, Anderson, I he's one of my favorite goalies in the NHL because he's both big physically, but he's quick on his feet. And six foot three, two hundred thirty six pounds, and he's twenty five years old, big and young. Yeah, and he's very quick on his feet. So the Flames need to get in front of him and also move the move him around because he, even though he is fast, he does tend to overcommit at times and it's not a lot but you know if you you're only needing a couple inches of space to fire the puck at you know that little bit does help so you know they do need to get their passing game going and getting them moving around in the net as well as good quality people in front to screen them properly and we saw that as a successful part of last round, too, especially in the early games, was the Flames being able to screen Eddie Lack, and that gave him a lot of success. I'm not a big Anderson, not that I'm not a fan of his, I just haven't been exposed to Anderson a lot, but from what I've seen, it looks like if you can get him out of position, it takes him a while to recover. Yeah, because he does overcommit just a smidge. Not a lot, but to be a problem, like uh, McElhenney and Irving did. Well, there's a reason those guys aren't starting goalies for a playoff team. True, but it it is enough, though, that if you're on your game, you can open up a lane to actually fire the puck in the net. And Anderson was with the team when Hiller was there, wasn't he? Yeah, he was backing them up. That's what I thought. So Hiller's probably got a bit of a book on Anderson, too, that he can share with his teammates. Yeah, and I'm sure that the Anaheim players have a book on Hiller, just a little. Very true. Yeah, <laughs> so, no, that's that's going to be true too. So, yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that I think the biggest, I think the the blue line has to be. We got to be able to get through that. I think Anderson's going to be a problem, but I think the Flames have the depth that they can they can make Anaheim's first line not as big a problem as say they were for Winnipeg. Yeah, and the Flames just need to keep doing what makes them successful and that's getting the 
puck up quick from their defensemen to their forwards and go in on the rush. Uh, if they can continue to do that and have Hoodler and Monaghan play better than they did in the first five games of round one, then they stand a chance to actually pull off the upset and win. If they get bogged down in the neutral zone and can't get their feet going, then I think Anaheim will take this easily. I agree with you. A quote from the other side of the ice, uh, Ducks coach Bruce Boudreau on Sunday was quoted as saying, they're a team that never quits. The minute you think you've got them, they apply an awful lot of pressure. We know their capabilities, and we know the fact they never quit. It's going to be a 60-minute game on both sides. So it sounds like the Ducks, I mean, you wouldn't probably do it in public anyways, but it sounds like they're not coming in overconfident on this one. They know the Flames are going to be a tough team to play against. Well, the Flames actually had, uh, I do believe, like 10 or 12 more goals this season. The better power play, the better penalty kill. So, you know, it, Anaheim got through a lot due to uh, winning games in the shootout, and they're kind of a bit of a mirage compared to what a number one seed normally is. There ain't no shootout to save them now. Exactly. And, like, while they did have a lot of comebacks, Calgary won most of their comebacks either in regulation or in overtime. But uh, Anaheim, they got their uh, games to the shootout. And, you know, when you have Corey Perry, Vatnin, uh, Getzlaff, and Silverberg, you're going to win a lot of shootouts. It's true. Yeah, I think Calgary's a better team playing... Um, you know, I don't want to say five on five because they have better special teams, but they're the better team playing hockey. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that uh, Calgary actually was better five on five as well in terms oh, of goals they? scored okay. and goals surrendered. So, like, uh, things are closer than that you would think looking at the standings and seeing a 12 point differential. The biggest thing I'm worried about going in this series is I think the Ducks are getting in the Flames' head, just the fact that they're this powerhouse team. Um, we heard Bob Hartley say earlier in the week, I don't remember his exact words, but he said something like, oh, they've been trying, they've put paper on the dressing room walls, and on one piece of paper, they're putting all the strengths for the Ducks, and on the other one, they're putting all the weaknesses, and that on the strength, they're run out of room, and on the weaknesses, still blank. He said, I'm not sure why we're even going. Um, you know, there's a quote from David Jones um, who said, we'll just have to find another gear. I'm not sure what it is. We just kind of buckled down. Um, you know, so I think, I think for some of the Flames players, they're feeling like they're going into this with no hope. It's like, oh, the, I know it's not their name anymore, but uh, it's almost apt to call them the Mighty Ducks at this point because that's who they are this year. They're, you know, the Mighty Ducks. Um, and it's, it seems like the team almost has this mental blockade that the Ducks are going to just roll over them. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I, Honestly, I, I would be shocked. Over that. I would be shocked if the Flames didn't win game 1. I think that it might just be BS trying to psych out the other team. Could be. I I think that if the the Flames if they don't get over that that mental block of we're going against the, you know, the Mighty Ducks, they're all powerful. They're not going to win this series. Oh, yeah. They can't. Well, no, of course. It, like, if you think that you're going to lose, then obviously that'll be a self fulfilling prophecy there. You need to go in saying, no, we're going to beat them and we're going to beat them easily. And, and I think, you know, the pressure is on the Ducks here. If we take out the Ducks, oh, yeah. I mean, in, that, you that's know, embarrassing. The Flames are the underdogs. Yeah, th that would be embarrassing for Anaheim, really. Because of the fact that they built their team to go win the Stanley Cup. Like, that's why they got Ryan Kessler. Exactly. They won the Western Conference, and they get taken out by the team that shouldn't even be there. Yeah. The team with the fewest points of anybody. You know, like, that would be a major embarrassment. So, you know, the way I look at it is the Flames have nothing to lose and everything to gain. And I think if they go in with that mentality that, you know what, we're going to be we're gonna be the the deal breakers here. We're going to be the ones that end this thing. Um, I, I really think that that could be the motivation they need, but they've got to get over what we're hearing in every interview, which is, you know, we can't beat the ducks. I don't know why we're going that sort of thing. Yeah. I, I think that's a lot of BS just to make the other team overconfident. 
I hope so. Because that, that's how it, I, I would play it. You know, make the, lull the other team into a false sense of security and then come game one, skate circles around them. I hope you're right, Matt. I hope we break the Honda Center curse and uh, win game one. What's your pr- prediction for this series? If you had to predict how the series is going to end and, uh, you know, how many games going to take by whom, what do you think? I'm going to go with Flames and Six. I think that they will overcome the Honda Center curse. I think they'll win two of the three games in Anaheim and close it out in Calgary. You're optimistic. I think the Flames can do uh, They can do it. I think they can win this series. I think it's going to be a tough series, but I think they can do it. I'm not confident in six. I'm going to say the Flames are going to take it in seven. We'll see. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is is that the Ducks could easily win this series in five, and that could happen. But yep. I think that the Flames have that special thing where they have no expectations. Like, they weren't even supposed to be here. So they have it's like the absolutely 14. There's no nothing pressure. To lose. Yeah, they, there's no pressure whatsoever. So that looseness and the youthful exuberance Flames players don't know that they're not supposed to win. You know what I mean? So they can just go out there and, like, if they lose, hey, they had an awesome season. It was only the second time the Flames have made it to the second round since 89, which that's pathetic in its own right, but that's another story. (laughs) But, you know, um, there's not anything more that you could ask from this team if they did bow out in the second round. So I think that looseness will help them to beat the Ducks. I agree. And I think the fact that they know they can play spoiler is going to motivate them that much more. You know, who doesn't want to be the ones that end up taking the Ducks out? Yeah, exactly. Especially after they manhandled the Jets. You know, like that would be a good way to like have bragging rights over Winnipeg as well. Exactly. And I think even if we... I think. The Flames have to look at this as an all-or-nothing series. We've got to go, you know, give it everything we've got, and if we make it through the Jets and we're just... Or, sorry, if we make it through the Ducks and we're just too exhausted after that, so be it that we can't make it through round three. But I think if we can go all out, we can wear the Ducks down, even if we lose. I don't know that if the Flames play the way they can, the Ducks are going to last much longer into a third series because I think we can really wear them down. Yeah. And that's where guys like Furland and Jones and that come in, where they can hit and exact a physical toll on them. Mm-hmm. Well, Matt, anything else about the upcoming Ducks series you want to talk about? No, just go Flames, go and give it them your best. It's it's going to be a tough series, um, but I think I think it's going to be fun to watch. You know, I think that there's going to be ups and downs. Um, but I think as Flames fans, if we look at it, that we've already won no matter what happens. We've already won this season. Um, I think Hartley's got the Jack Adams in the bag. I think the Flames, no matter who you talk to, have won this season. This is bonus. This is like the, the special features on a DVD. Let's go out, let's have some fun, and let's see how well we can do. Exactly. And I'm just hopeful that they can make it very difficult on Anaheim one way or the other. I totally agree. So we will, you and I will talk next week, um, shortly after the first, what, couple games, probably the first two games of the series, um, depending on when that third game is played. So hopefully we'll have some positive um, positive news to report to everybody at that point. Um, before we go, though, I know you'll probably want to comment on this. New general manager in Edmonton, Peter Chiarelli. What are your thoughts, Matt? I think that Edmonton signed the wrong guy. Really? Yeah. Why is that? If you look at uh, how Boston was made into the Stanley Cup champion team that they did, it was actually the guy that uh, Chiarelli replaced that did most of the work, including negotiating the contract for Chara, acquiring Rask, and putting most of the pieces in place. So... And he has since went on to be with the New York Rangers, and we've seen the Rangers become one of the top teams in the league. And Boston is has waffled ever since they won the Stanley Cup. So 
I think that they actually went out and got the wrong guy. Interesting. That's not to say that he's not an improvement over McTavish, but, you know, that's not saying much. I've been a fan of Chirelli's for a while. I think what he did in Boston was good. I think he's a lot like Jay Feaster in that he's the the business guy, not necessarily the hockey guy. So I'll be curious to see who he brings in as the hockey guy. Um, it used to be John Weisbrod, who you know we had here as our hockey guy for a while. But I look at it as a good step forward for the Oilers. They finally cleaned house, which what you and I said they needed to do in the front office. And whether, you know, I don't think Torelli's the guy that's going to get them to the playoffs or get them a cup, but I think he's a good step forward and a guy that can put them, sort of give them a long-term plan that somebody else might be able to execute on later. I think he can bring in the right coach. He can bring in some players over the summer. Um, I I, th- I look at him as the first step of a long of a long line of good moves that I think they're ready to make. Yeah, and it is an improvement for sure. I just don't think that he will be as good as I think Oilers fans and you know other people would think he will be. I think, though, if you're an Oilers fan, I mean, you know, with the management they've had there, it's hopeful, right? It's now showing change, which we haven't seen there for a while. So I can see why Oilers Oilers fans think he's going to be as good as he is. And I think he's going to surprise for at least a year or so. But, I, yeah, I don't think he's the guy, say, for eight, ten years, um, you know, he's going to lead this team back to a dynasty like some people think he is. Yeah. Well, I just hope that he trades Taylor Hall for the same package that he got for Tyler Sagan, which was basically nothing. I don't know if he'll make that mistake again, because, I mean, he wanted to move Sagan out of town, because wasn't he disruptive, or he was out partying or something? Yeah, but still. So I think he just wanted to move the player. Yeah, but he didn't get anything really for him, so. No. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just I look at it as a step forward, and I'm happy that Edmonton is finally taking that step forward. I never thought I'd say I'm happy for Edmonton, but oh, yeah. I'm, happy, it's an I'm happy the Oilers fan has made the change that needs to be made. They've got a new general manager coming in, and I think it shows a new era of the Oilers. Yeah, and at least Torelli never played for Edmonton, so at least you got that going for them. <laughs> that we know of. Yeah, He may have used an alias, you never know. Has he worked for the Oilers in any capacity as a scout or a lawyer? No, or a player he agent? was with Ottawa before Boston. Okay, good. So he has no ties to the organization. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Matt, as always, I want to remind people about our listener survey. Um, we're trying to collect some information from our listeners about what they like about the show and the website, um, what they want to see different, things that maybe you know you want to see that we're not doing or you want to tell us to keep doing things that we're doing. So... Um, your feedback is important to us and how we go forward with the show. We're looking to make some changes in the off season and we want your feedback. Um, if you want to take the survey, go to firesidechat.ca slash survey, or if you go to the fireside chat website of firesidechat.ca, you'll see the link right near the top there. And one thing we are doing is if you take the survey and you give us your information at the end, you don't have to, it's optional, but if you do, uh, we're going to enter you into a random drawing for a cool prize pack that we've put together. And right now that prize pack contains a Fireside Chat t-shirt, a Calgary Flames baseball cap, a Fireside Chat can cooler, uh, some temporary tattoos, both for the Flames and our logo, uh, some Flames stickers, a Flames bag, and something new that you donated is a collectible set of the 2013 reading Give It a Shot Calgary Flames bookmarks. So you'll get the complete set of 2013 bookmarks, which is kind of a neat little throw in there. Yeah. And also, uh, just to preview something that will be coming up following the postseason, I will be posting articles uh, previewing all the players that are expected to go in the top two rounds. And I figure that with the Flames having six picks in the top 90, that, you know, it'll give some more information on who's available and all that. So once the Flames are done in the postseason, whether it's against Anaheim or when they're lifting the Stanley Cup. The articles will begin to get posted in preparation for the entry draft. So, you know, go to the website. um, Tell us what you like. Tell us what you want to see in those articles, um, if that's useful content for you. The survey is only going to take you about 10, 15 minutes. So, you know, do it while you're, well, you're not while you're driving to work, but, you know, maybe during your lunch break or something like that. We would really appreciate it, and it gives us... um, some idea of what you guys want because we're doing this for you guys matt and i could sit at home and talk flames hockey anytime 
uh, this show is, you know, for the audience. So let us know what you want to see there. Um, and Matt, the the last thing I wanted to do before we leave today, um, when I think back to the 04 run, I don't know about you, but one of the parts that sticks in my mind, it was the the anthem for that run, which was In the Dome. Do you remember the song? Oh, yeah, In the Dome, Chilling with Jerome. Yeah, exactly. Everyone remembers that song. And I remember as the playoffs went on, they kept changing and adding player names to it. And I think there was, I remember hearing at the time, Vibe 98.5, the radio station at the time, did it. I remember hearing the players in the dressing room were actually disappointed they weren't in the song. So I think at one point they did a version with everybody's name in it. And it's so weird to think of, but the first thing I thought of when the Flames made the playoffs when they beat LA this year was... Who am I going to be chilling in the dome with this year? And there's been a lot of playoff anthems put out. Um, we saw, you know, even the CPO, there's a video going around, did something. But um, I'm happy to say there is a new 2015 version of In the Dome. Um, Virgin Radio, who's taken over for Vibe, has got the original singer, uh, Getty, back with their own DJ Fuzzy, and they've put out a new version. So right after our show, right after the close of the show, we're going to play the full version there for you. So if you want to hear the new version, stick around. And uh, I hope you're like me and it brings back all sorts of nostalgic memories. It doesn't rhyme as well as it used to, but it's a great playoff anthem. Yeah, and if you haven't seen the Calgary Philharmonics version, the uh, what they did, just check it out on YouTube. It's quite impressive as well. And nice to see the Philharmonic back in the flames. There's been all sorts of um, all sorts of playoff anthems. Some that are good, like Arenas Can't Hold Us. Have you heard that yes. one? And then there's been some really odd ones um, that somebody did a version of, um, what is it, Cowtown Funk, which is a version of Uptown Funk. And it has potential, but it's just so poorly recorded. And I don't know. I think it's cool how many people are trying to do this. But, yeah, to me, Into Dome is still the kind of official Flames anthem, if you will. Yeah. So, Matt, let's enjoy the week. Let's hope the Flames go duck hunting early because duck duck season here in Alberta, I guess, now starts on Thursday. And we'll talk to you next week, my friend. Yeah, go Flames go and kick some butt in Anaheim. Exactly. You better come back here with at least one win. We want two. <laughs> we want two. I'll take one, though. Yeah. I don't want to come back down two games to none. I think that uh, we're, we might be screwed if that happens. Yeah, definitely. But if we can at least get one of them and split the series, I think coming back with at least one win, the Dome's going to be electric and the Flames are going to probably take uh, both of the home games again, I hope. Yeah, we'll see. Lots of fun right. still to come. Exactly. Enjoy the playoff run, and we'll talk to everyone next week. Yeah, take care, everybody. Have a good one. You can find me in the hole, chilling with Jerome, Jerome, Jerome. Man, Jerome's not here no more. Here we go now. You can find me in the hole, chilling with the flames. What? Playing for the cup. That's right. Let's bring it home. Seas flaming on my chest. Red miles still strong. What I tell you about the West? Time, let's get it on. Let's go. I'm in the hole, chilling with the flames. Yes. Playing for the cup. That's right. Let's bring it home. Seas flaming on my chest. You. Red miles still we strong. Coming, what baby. I tell you about the West? Time, let's get Yo, it on. Let's do this. 2015, here's a history lesson. Back in 2004, them other teams were stressing. 11 years later, and we're back in the hunt. The quest for Lord Stanley, Stanley Cup. No one expected this, we were in a rebuild. Take a look around the dome, all the seats are filled. Dig your car flags out, cause it's playoff time. That's why we're rebooting this timeless rhyme. 1989, the flame straight burned it up. Back in 04, the lightning straight stole the cup. Round one, we've got the knucks, man, they better knuckle up. Just like 50. He said to pray, man, we're whooping some butt. And, uh, Get it. I ain't even trying to brag and sound cocky. Uh -uh. Why you think they call the kid Johnny Hockey? Your will ain't will enough. Your skill ain't skill enough against Monahan and Hoodler. You ain't kill enough. But all y'all really need to know is that our team is deep. Not as deep as we gon' bury teams this week. So you can come and try to win and take it on the chin. Or save yourself embarrassment. Quit and pack it in. Because your offense broke down. It's easy to see. Your defense is like E-fence. Where's the D? <laughs> Anybody seen the D? Ha, they didn't bring no D. And you can find me in the dome, chilling with the flames, what? playing for the cup. That's right. Let's bring it home. Seas flaming on my chest, red miles still strong. What I tell you about the West? It's time. Let's get it on. Let's go. I'm in the dome, chilling with the flames, playing for the cup. That's 
Let's bring it home, seas flaming on my chest Red mile still strong What I tell you about the rest is time Let's get it on Go Flames Go 98.5 Virgin Radio Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.